Over the next few lectures, we're going to be talking about different types of somatoform disorders. People with somatoform disorders experience body-based or somatic symptoms like pain, nausea, shortness of breath, or headaches. However, while these symptoms resemble or take the form of physical diseases like heart disease, stroke, or infection, their origin is ultimately psychological or behavioral in nature, and there is no objective evidence of medical pathology. For this reason, somatoform disorders all involve the presence of medically unexplained symptoms, such as someone with recurrent chest pain showing no evidence of a heart attack on EKG, or someone presenting with sudden onset of muscle weakness showing no signs of a stroke on head imaging. There are a lot of disorders that feature medically unexplained symptoms, and they could hardly be more different in terms of their underlying cause, prognosis, and treatment considerations. We will dive into each of these in more detail over the next few videos, but just to give you a lay of the land, let's start with a brief overview of each. First, somatic symptom disorder is when a patient experiences recurrent medically explained symptoms and is distressed and disabled by them. Notably, these symptoms are genuinely experienced by the patient. In contrast, factitious disorder and malingering are when the patient knowingly fakes having an illness. In factitious disorder, this is done to gain the social benefits associated with the sick rule, such as sympathy and attention, while in malingering the goal is to obtain some external reward like disability payments. Next, hypochondriasis or illness anxiety disorder is less about medically unexplained symptoms and more about an obsessional belief that one has a medical illness despite all evidence to the contrary. In fact, hypochondriasis has more to do with OCD than it does with the other somatoform disorders and is more properly grouped in with OCD spectrum disorders. Finally, conversion disorder is similar to somatic symptom disorder in that the signs and symptoms are genuinely experienced. However, it differentiates itself from somatic symptom disorder in that it involves specifically neurologic abnormalities such as weakness, numbness, blindness, or seizures. As we'll find out later, conversion disorder shares a lot in common with dissociative disorders and is perhaps best understood through that lens. Okay, so those are the main disorders featuring medically unexplained symptoms in a nutshell. We'll talk more about each of those disorders in future videos. For the rest of this video, we're going to be focusing in on somatic symptom disorder in particular and leave a full discussion of the other disorders for later talks. So, what is somatic symptom disorder? Historically, the starting point for somatic symptom disorder was the mere presence of medically unexplained symptoms. However, because grounding a diagnosis on the absence of an explanation is a fundamentally problematic notion, the diagnostic criteria now include a greater focus on maladaptive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors related to the symptoms. This shift in focus is reflected in the current DSM diagnostic criteria, which you can memorize using the mnemonic SUM ADDIC. Let's go over these criteria one by one. First, the S will remind you that somatic symptoms are at the core of this disorder. The specific symptoms involved can range from mild to severe and can involve every organ system in the body, with pain, fatigue, headaches, dizziness, stiffness, itching, chest tightness, palpitations, wheezing, shortness of breath, nausea, diarrhea, constipation, and urinary pain all being common. The gastrointestinal tract is the most common location for somatic symptoms, with over 95% of patients experiencing unexplained symptoms in this organ system. In women, gynecologic complaints such as pelvic pain and menstrual irregularity are the second most common symptom and are experienced by over 90% of women with somatoform disorders. The vast majority of patients with persistent somatization experience symptoms in multiple organs of the body throughout their life. However, ultimately only one is required, which is the O of somatic. The M and E will remind us that the symptoms are either medically unexplained, with no physical abnormalities being found, or so clearly in excess of what would be expected from any known physical disease that it suggests a large psychological component. The next few letters will remind us that the symptoms must be accompanied by maladaptive thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, such as anxiety about what the symptom could mean, frequently thinking about the symptom, and lots of time and energy being spent in activities related to the symptom, such as researching things online for hours each day. As with other mental disorders, the patient must be clearly impaired or distressed by the disorder. Finally, somatic symptom disorder is chronic, lasting months or years at a time. As mentioned before, symptoms in somatic symptom disorder are genuinely experienced. This contrasts with other conditions, such as factitious disorder or malingering, where signs and symptoms are feigned or intentionally induced. 
However, the line between real and fake symptoms is not always clear cut, and around 20% of people who experience somatization have intentionally self-induced a disease state on at least one occasion. Behaviorally, people with medically unexplained symptoms often persist in seeking medical care despite repeated negative examinations and tests. For this reason, people who somatize frequently can incur healthcare costs up to 10 times higher than people who do not, including more primary care appointments, more specialist consultations, more emergency department visits, and more hospital admissions. These patients are also much more likely to be prescribed unnecessary medications and be subjected to invasive tests, procedures, and even surgical operations. People with frequent and severe somatization undergo a median of eight surgical procedures over their lifetime, with procedures on the uterus and gastrointestinal tract being the most common. These surgeries are much more likely to be diagnostically and therapeutically unhelpful, with over 60% of surgeries and persistent somatizers showing no abnormal findings. Because of this, people with persistent somatization are at high risk for iatrogenic injuries, including surgical accidents, complications from anesthesia, medication side effects, and radiation exposure. This makes understanding, preventing, and treating somatization a major personal and public health concern. With that in mind, let's look at the data behind the disorder, including who gets it, what happens once they get it, and what forms of treatment are most helpful. First, it's important to recognize that somatization is universal. Every person alive has experienced symptoms for which no cause can be found. In fact, it is believed that up to a third of all primary care visits are for medically unexplained symptoms. For most patients, these symptoms are transient and resolve on their own. For a significant minority of patients, however, somatization becomes persistent and leads to distress and dysfunction. These people are said to be suffering from somatoform disorders. The prevalence of somatoform disorders in the general population is about 5%, making it neither as common as disorders like depression and anxiety, nor as rare as disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Women are affected vastly more often than men, with some estimates placing the gender ratio as high as 10 to 1. Persistent somatization begins as early as childhood, and for people with chronic somatoform complaints, this pattern almost always begins before the age of 30. For most people, somatization is a transient phenomenon which tends to increase around times of stress. However, for around 25% of people with somatoform symptoms that are severe enough to go to a doctor's office, somatization becomes chronic and enduring. For those with persistent somatization, the vast majority improve during follow-up, even without treatment. However, for around 20% of persistent somatizers, the clinical course is characterized by worsening symptoms and increasing anxiety. Because people presenting with somatoform disorders are often seen in primary care clinics or other non-psychiatric settings, treatment is frequently given by providers who have not received specific training in these disorders. In addition, patients with somatoform disorders are often quite hesitant to see mental health providers out of concern that their symptoms will be dismissed as psychosomatic or otherwise not taken seriously. Because of this, somatoform disorders are often trapped in a no-man's land between primary care, neurologists, and other specialists who are asked to see these patients but don't believe that they can help, and psychiatrists who may feel more able to help but often won't be seen by the patients. Because of this, treating somatic symptom disorder requires a fundamentally different approach. Use the mnemonic I do care to remember the necessary ingredients for successful treatment of somatic symptom disorder. First, the I is for interface. Patients who somatize tend to have many healthcare providers, including multiple specialists in various areas of medicine. Work closely to interface with all medical providers on the patient's team and integrate your findings so that none of you are working in isolation. Next, do is for do no harm. Patients who somatize are at high risks for injury, disability, and even death as a result of frequent tests and treatment. Because of this, keep the phrase do no harm firm in your mind and always weigh the potential risks of treatment against the benefits to avoid doing more harm than good. Next, C is for CBT. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the best studied treatment for somatization, with small to moderate effects and benefits that are durable, lasting years even after treatment is stopped. Mindfulness-based therapies have also been shown to be helpful, with a similar effectiveness. However, getting patients to buy into the idea that they need these treatments can be difficult, leading to high dropout rates. Next, A is for antidepressants. Antidepressants are the best studied medication treatment for somatic symptom disorder, and evidence suggests that they can be effective, though with a smaller effect compared to CBT. 
However, the potential benefits must be weighed against the possibility that the medications themselves can cause side effects, which may trigger further somatic symptoms. Next, R is for regular visits. For someone with severe anxiety about physical symptoms, a visit to the doctor can be very comforting. However, this can have the effect of inadvertently reinforcing the patient for having experienced severe symptoms in the first place, as it is easy for the patient to think, even unconsciously, that I get to go to the doctor only when I'm sick. You can reduce this association by scheduling visits on a regular basis rather than only seeing the patient when they have a physical complaint. Finally, E is for empathy. Try to spend most of your time during the appointment listening to the patient, empathizing with their distress, and educating them on the overall good prognosis for the symptoms that they're concerned about, like telling them, in similar cases that I've worked on, these symptoms went away on their own without the need for potentially harmful treatments, and I'm hopeful that this will happen for you too. As a final note, it's worth being cautious when diagnosing somatic symptom disorder, as this has a high chance of producing the negative aspects of diagnosis, such as being highly stigmatizing, without delivering much in the way of benefits, as it doesn't really validate distress. When done incorrectly, telling a patient about a diagnosis of a somatoform disorder can significantly damage the doctor-patient relationship, especially if it's implied that the problem is all in their head. The best approach to take here is to remember that taking a patient seriously does not always mean taking them literally. If we treated all patients with somatic symptom disorder as if they had organic medical diseases, then we would open them up to all the risks of unnecessary medical care that we talked about earlier. However, we also should not ignore the pain and distress that underlie the somatic symptoms that these patients experience. If you make sure to always take the patient seriously without necessarily taking them literally, you can walk a middle ground between these two extremes. Thanks for watching this video. We'll continue our journey through potential causes of medically unexplained symptoms in the next video when we talk about factitious disorder and malingering. In the meantime, consider subscribing to my channel and picking up my book, Memorable Psychiatry on Amazon, for more information on these disorders. Until next time, bye for now.